372. We'll sing the first and the last verse. 372. everybody. Covered your prayers this morning. I've been sick for the last two or three days and I'm still a little bit under the weather and uh, feeling a little weak this morning to be honest with you and really appreciate your prayers. Uh, I've gotten a little, very little sleep as well but I had a lot of pain in my middle of my back. That's the hardest spot to reach and uh, appreciate my wife. Uh, my, my, my parents have had two major uh, surgeries. They had to have three or four vertebrae uh, replaced in their back with cadaver bone. Can you imagine having cadaver bone in your body but that's what they had to put in, and so uh, I don't know if it runs in our family, what the deal is, but it's been excruciating pain, so I've had very little sleep over the last week, actually, and just covered your prayers, amen? God is faithful. We're street, weak, he is strong, amen? amen? And so we appreciate him. Look at Genesis 24 this morning, and uh, let's have a little pop quiz. How many of y'all like pop quizzes? No one raised their hands, of course, amen? And uh, last week, we had an opportunity to look at this very same chapter, Genesis 24, and we're able to look at the types in the Bible here. And we'll start with Abraham. Abraham was a type of what? Remember? Who did Abraham represent in this story? God the Father. That's right. And then who did Isaac represent? Jesus Christ, right? Who did Eleazar, the servant, represent in this story? Eleazar was sent out by God the Father, the Holy Spirit. That's right. And then what about Laban, Rebecca's brother? Who did he represent? What's that? Yeah, the unbeliever that rejects Christ, right? When the servant came, he wasn't interested in the servant, was he? He was interested in the gifts that he saw his sister had, right? And just like the unsaved world, they want all the, the blessings but not the devotion to the Lord, amen? And then what about Rebecca herself? Who did she represent? The bride of Christ, you and I, amen? What a beautiful story. Well, this morning we're going to look at it in more of a practical sense, as we look at the relationship in our marriages, amen, as we look at this. And so let's go ahead and look at Genesis 24 and look at verses 1 through 4. Uh, we're going to give you nine points today that we get from this chapter uh, that we can apply to our lives and in the lives of our children when it comes to marriage. 
Uh, the first thing we see is that marriages must only be in the Lord. And you may say, well, Pastor, well we, we get that. that. That's common sense. That's basic uh, Christianity 101. That's the ABCs of Christian growth. We get that. Let me just tell you, over the last 18, 19 years of being in ministry, I can tell you that it's not, it's not a no-brainer for a lot of folks. I've seen many of uh, young people get married to someone who was not saved or someone who did not love the Lord. And let me just tell you, it's, it's not just a given. And if you look at it that way, you're making a big mistake. Amen. Uh, we should never take anything for granted or assume upon the Lord in any area of our Christian life. Every area must be taken seriously. Wouldn't you say amen to that? Amen. It says in verse 1, it says, And Abraham was old and well stricken uh, in age. You know, it's just like any other parent that loves their children. We want to make sure our kids are okay when we pass on. Uh, no one, first of all, wants to see their children pass on before they do. You know, and, and, and then we also want to make sure they're okay financially, but especially spiritually, we want to make sure they're okay. And one of the ways we can know that is to make sure they marry the right person. I know that's a burden on my heart. I know if my children marry the, the right person, that's the biggest part of my battle. I really understand because they can serve the Lord together. Amen. They have all things in common in the Lord. But it goes on. It says he was old. He was 140 years old. Isaac was 40 here. And it goes on. It says in verse one. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And so here we see a man that had learned to trust in the Lord, who had been an example to his son. In verse two, it says, and Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. In other words, if this was the last thing that he was going to say before he died, he did not die right away here. But if this was going to be the last thing, this is what would have been on his heart and mind to make sure that his son gets married to the right one before he passes on. And so he's, he makes an oath here with his servant. He says that thou shalt not take a wife, not take a wife unto my son, my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Verse four, but thou shalt go into my country and into my kindred. We're talking about the saved in the land. Amen. And take a wife unto my son, Isaac. Obviously, we know that there was no uh, suitable mate for Isaac in the land of Canaan. They were idol worshipers. We know that from reading our scriptures and they they did not know the true and living God. So the Bible for the Christian is our instruction manual. It gives us definite instructions in every area, main area of the Christian life that we need to know this side of eternity. Amen. And it gives us specific and definite uh, instructions in the area of marriage as well, because we know that marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. It's very near and dear to the Lord's heart. And we find it near and dear to God. The father represented here in Abraham here is near and dear to his heart as well. And it's near and dear for the Lord that we be pure with him as the bride of Christ that we seek out and do his will with our lives. And we don't waste our lives, amen, in this world, but that we live for the next world, the next life. And so there is to be no marriages. The Bible makes it very clear. It's a command to an unbeliever. He makes it very clear. Abraham could not imagine his son marrying anyone in Canaan. He was called there for a purpose, to eradicate the folks that were there so they can establish a Christian nation there on earth. And so we see that here. As a matter of fact, if you look at Genesis 22, uh, we see in verse 20, it says, and it came to pass after these things, he said, what things? Right when Abraham was falling through the Lord's command to, to, to sacrifice his son, and, and the angel came and stayed his hand, at that moment, it says, after these things, look what happened here. It says that it was told Abraham, saying, behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz, his firstborn, and Buzz, how would you like that name, his brother, and Kimio, the father of Aram, and Chesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jilaf, and Bethel. And Bethel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Naor, Abraham's brother. So immediately after Abraham was tried and tested, the very first thing that, that was told him was that there is a wife for your son Isaac. Because remember, he, he was going to have a descendant as numerous as the sands, sands of the uh, earth and the... And, and, and the uh, Stars in the sky. You remember that? And so here it was very pretty that God wanted to seek his will through Abraham. In order to do that, his son Isaac had to be obedient and Abraham had to make sure that Isaac married the right person. It's the same thing for you and I. We're of father Abraham. He's our father. Amen. And because of that, we have the same blessings that he promised to Abraham or, or promised to us. And it is our responsibility to make sure our children marry someone in the Lord so that we can continue the Christian heritage. We can continue to number the earth with Christians. Amen. That's really what it's all about. In 1 Corinthians 7, 39, Paul makes it clear here when he talks about uh, some of the 
uh, details of divorce. He says, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, but it says here, only in the Lord. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? How can two be married if that one doesn't know the Lord, doesn't love the Lord, and the other one does? There will, there will be dissension in that marriage. 1 Corinthians 6.14, very familiar scripture here uh, that we pretty much all know. Some of the first scriptures we hear when we get saved, we're being discipled. But it says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? I mentioned this last week. My brother just got saved about a couple weeks ago. And uh, it's amazing to get these texts from him on, the, on a weekly basis. Last night he sent me a text about how we as Christians are called a, a Christian soldiers. And he says, brother, we've got to stand up. We've got to be ready to fight. I said, amen. I'm just so excited to get these texts from my brother. Now we have true fellowship. Now we have things in common because, because of who? Because of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus does when he comes to our life. Amen. He brings us closer together as church family and as people of God. We'll spend all eternity together. Amen. And so God said, God wants earth to be a little bit of taste of heaven uh, on earth in our families. We know we won't get that in the world, but in our families, we need to have that. Amen. It's very important that our, our home should be a reach where we plug in our batteries. In other words, when I go home, I want it to be a time when I'm leaving the, the, the filth and sin of the world and coming home, being able to plug in my batteries at home, be recharged, and say, man, there is a little bit of peace on earth. That's the way it ought to be in our homes. Amen. That's what we want. And so it says, in what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living gods. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Man, this really brings it home to think about that God dwells in us. Our bodies are his holy temple. And for us to be married into one who represents an idol, or one of um, Belial, or a false god, or idols, Wow, what, what worse can't sin can we commit it against the Lord? We really need to see this. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. That cannot ha happen if we marry outside of Christ. And then lastly, in chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, I love it, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, I've had many situations over the years that have been pressed upon me. I remember one in particular where we had a family join our church. Actually, it was a father who had been divorced and his son. He was, he was uh, parenting his son by himself. And uh, I fell in love with his son. I took him under my wings and uh, he went off to the military and called me up probably a couple, about a year later and said he was going to get married. He wanted me to be there at his wedding. And then I asked him a few questions. I said, is the young lady you're marrying, is she a Christian? And he said, no. And it, it pained me to tell him this. I said, but in my heart as a pastor, I, I cannot attend that. I cannot condone that. And it broke my heart to have to do that. Maybe you have a different conviction. I don't know. But me as a, as a leader in the church, I just could not do that. Uh, I had another situation where a young lady came to our church when she was in junior high. Uh, my wife would go by and pick her up every, every Wednesday night and bring her. Uh, parents never attended our church. And uh, we didn't see her after, when she got in high school, we didn't see her for many years. All of a sudden, 10 years later, I get a call. Uh, and she tells me her name, and of course, I don't remember who it is, right? And uh, she begins to explain who she was and explain some things about the youth group and kind of bring it back to memory here, and I remember who she was. She says, I want you to come to my, my wedding. I'm getting married, and I want you to, to, uh, to pray in our wedding. I said, okay. Uh, so I begin to ask her questions like I always do and uh, find out that her, her husband was in the military. He was a fine young man. I said, do me a favor. Come by church on Wednesday night. Come to our group here. And then we'll talk after, after the service, which you know what I had in mind, right? So they came in, and I preached a message that night on Wednesday night, uh, went into our office. And uh, he actually had raised his hand during the message. He came in, and I uh, showed him how he could be saved, and the young man got saved. And after that, I said, I'd be glad to pray at your wedding. Amen? And so all I'm saying is this. When it's an unsaved person, and neither one is saved, and it's okay because, you know, uh, they're unsaved. But when it's a Christian involved, we've got to be careful about that thing. It's not that we don't want to reach them and try to witness them. But we can't compromise our faith. Uh, it's never wrong to do right. How, how does it go? It's never right to do wrong in order to do right. Right? We can't do that. And so anyway, that's my conviction, and that's what I see here. Number two, uh, marriages must have God in the center of their relationship by including parents, parent figures, or pastoral, pastoral staff. Oftentimes, people get married older in life, or, and they're not, they don't have that relationship with their parents. Their parents may not be saved. There may be a young person who's saved and older, and it may be a pastor that steps in for them, or maybe a saved aunt or uncle, whatever the case may be, 
But we saw in Genesis 24 the importance of that. You say, why is that the case? Well, we saw here how Abraham was involved in the marriage of his son Isaac, even though his son was already 40 years of age. Well, the reason is, is that parents have our best interests in mind, don't they? They should. Amen. Uh, they have been down that road before, either by setting the example or making mistakes. They've been down that road before, and they also have God's authority over you. They are also seeking God's will and what's best for you in your life. And also they are trusting God to prepare a mate for you. I think about in, in, in the very first book of the Bible, in the very beginning, how God brought uh, Eve to Adam. That system was way back in the beginning. That was God's plan that we trust God to bring the right person into our children's life. In Genesis 24, and verse 7, it says this. It says, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me and that swear unto me, saying unto thy seed will I give this land, he shall send his angels before thee. Here we see here that they're trusting in the Lord, right? The Lord will send his angels before the, the, the uh, servant, and thou shalt take a wife unto the son from thence. I believe with all my heart that when we're seeking to do God's will, that God will always intercede on our behalf. I really believe that with all my heart. We see here that we're given uh, some knowledge here, parents. It's parents are to prepare their children for marriage, both morally and spiritually. They are to warn them about an unsuitable mate. In Proverbs 1.10, Solomon, as he's writing to his son, said, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. In Proverbs 6, he gives him warning about desiring the wrong type of mate or the wrong type of woman. He says in verse 23, For the commandment is a lamp. There we see that the, the word of God is like a lamp that, that directs each step. And sometimes in following God's will is step by step. And then it goes on and says, and the law is a light. In other times, it will seem like God is revealing a whole lot more to you. and You'll be able to see an actual pathway. And then it says, and reproofs of instructions are the way of life. In verse 24, for the, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with thy eyelids. You won't believe this, but... It, on a weekly basis, I'm constantly counseling in my office young people that, are, uh, they, they, they don't have a lot of self-confidence, so the way to speak. They've been listening to the world and watching the commercials and the TV programs. And they come to a point where they don't see themselves as beautiful or worth much. And as soon as some young boy or some young girl comes along that shows them interest, they forget all about their Christian character and morals. Why? Because they're lonely. They're seeking for attention. You get what I'm saying? That's what the Bible is saying here. The Bible says the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. In other words, stay close to the word of God. Trust God. Don't trust the world. Amen. That's what we're going to teach our children is because they're going to be vulnerable at times. And you know, let me give you a secret a word of advice. Teenagers do not always open up to their parents. They don't. Oftentimes they'll tell other people that don't have uh, their best interest in mind the things they should be telling you and I we got to be careful that we're spending time with our, our teenagers. A lot of times it's real easy to let our teenagers go because they're older. Some of them grow beards when they're 13, and we say, oh, man, they're all grown up. No, they're not. They're, they're big on the outside, but they're little on the inside. <laughs> Amen? They really need a lot of guidance. They really do. That's the reason why we preach. You bring them to Sunday school. You bring them on Wednesday night. You keep them involved in church. It's very important. So he, so he begins to warn them about desiring the wrong type of mate. And then he begins to warn them about hanging around the wrong places. Proverbs 7, verse 6, it says, For to the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones, the naive, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way of her house in the twilight in the evening in the black and the dark of night. Here we see he's warning about the places we go, the things that we do. We have these little devices called phones now. There's 24-7 access to anywhere we want to go on the Internet in the world. It used to be we'd have to go out and get it. You know, the parents, when you leave home to go play uh, as a kid, your parents say, well, you better stay out of trouble. Now trouble's right on these devices. Trouble finds you. You don't have to go looking for it. You say, what do you mean? I can tell you right now, 80% of the problems that we have in the public school that I see come through my office have to do with this device. You don't, even want, you don't even want to imagine the things that these little sixth grade girls are doing with these devices and what they're using these devices for. Your minds will be blown away. Let me just tell you, it is wicked, it is filthy. No sixth grade kid should know anything about these things, but yet the majority of them are doing it. 
And they're doing it in a prideful way. They're passing around and making a name for themselves, as a matter of fact, using these devices. And the Bible says these are naive ones. They're void of understanding. They're simple youth. That ought not be our kids. Amen. We have the word of God. We have instructions from God on high. I'll never forget when I first met Brother Brian Sams. I don't know if some of y'all know Brother Brian Sams. He's a pastor now in Jacksonville. A real good friend of mine. And I, I heard him speak at one of the breakout sessions with our young ladies and our young guys. They had a special breakout session that had to do with marriage. And he was talking about purity. And this is right before God had called him into evangelism, or actually before he went on to evangelism. Actually, we were one of the first churches that he came to. And he was, he was talking about how he met his wife, Angie. Uh, he talked about how he got saved a little bit later in life. She had grown up in a Christian home and so forth and talking about the differences between their lives and how uh, he loved how the relationship that Angie had with her father. Uh, Angie's parents, of course, were great people. I knew them personally as well. Went on a mission trip with them a couple of occasions. Very gr great and godly family. And he was talking about how the relationship she had with her dad was so intimate and close and how uh, he realized that the love that she had for her dad, that he had to step up and be that right person for, for Angie. And, and he told me the story, how the story went and how um, Angie, or Angie's dad called her over and he said, Angie, he said, uh, uh, as she asked him, what do you think about uh, Brian, dad? He said this. He said, uh, Angie, let me ask you a question. He said, if I were to tell you that Brian was not good for you, would you listen to me? And Angie said these words with tears coming out of her face. She says, Dad, of course I would. Of course I would listen to you, Dad. You see, that's the kind of relationship we want to have with our children so that we have their hearts. Amen. Amen. And, then, and then he turned to Angie and said this. He says, I think Brian is a great guy. And, of course, she was just overjoyed. You see, she had her dad's blessing. She did it the right way. You know, we started praying for our children's mate when they were one years old. They had no idea what we were doing, but we were praying for that. Now when we do it, of course, my daughter acts as though she's embarrassed, amen? <laughs> but uh, we've been doing it from day one. You see, this might seem old-fashioned and outdated, but the Bible's never outdated, amen? The Bible's never old-fashioned. We see that all throughout the Scripture. We see that, you know, I would, I would suggest the guidance of parents in marriage is God's best for those who are willing to obey the scriptural and logical principle that we see here in the Bible. We see Father Abraham did not want Isaac to experience the modern day scene that we see today played out. You know, modern day dating is primarily characterized by emotion, uh, it's characterized by flexibility desires, erratic behaviors, uh, and values of the world. Selfish interests predominate these type of relationships. We see it in the movies, we see it in Hollywood, all around us. And these are the things that our kids see. It became very popular during the Industrial Revolution. You say, why is that? Well, what happened? Before that, many people were farmers. They worked at home. They took on the trades of their fathers many times. And every, all the schooling was at home. But during the Industrial Revolution, everything changed. Now there was a, a city being built up. There were people moving into the city. Young people left home a lot earlier. They began to date and go out and do things like that. They were more independent from their family members at an earlier age. And so we began to see more of the dating scene come, up, come upon the scene. And that's the same culture that we see today in our nation. Could you imagine this, Isaac or Jacob? Remember last week I told you what the camel was, right? The camel is a Texas pickup, amen, because it carries a lot of cargo. But could you imagine Isaac and Jacob uh, on their camels going down Palestine Boulevard, picking up ladies on the street? I couldn't imagine that being practiced back in those days because it didn't happen, amen? You see, in Bible times, the responsibility of mom and dad were involved in marriage arrangement. Think about this for a moment. When we see a marriage take place, who walks the daughter down the aisle? Dad does, right? What is the significance of that? He's to give her what? Away, right? Now think about that. Up to that point, dad has been the, the, the most important man in her life. He's been numero uno. And at that moment in time, dad is saying in all his heart that I'm, I'm willing to give my daughter away to a young man who has my blessing that I know will take care of my daughter from this point forward because he's no longer my responsibility in that way. Does that make sense? And that's a picture of what we're actually doing, but do we practice that in our life up to that point? That's the question we've got to ask ourselves as Christians. It's very vital that we get that. You see, when we, we have a young man drop to our house in a, in a brand new Mustang that he did not pay for, and he picks up our daughter and takes her out and goes wherever he wants to go, we're giving him the freedom to do what only dad should be able to do because dad is still paying her bills. He cannot support her. He cannot take care of her. Mighty quiet. 
All I'm asking you to do this morning is evaluate what we do compared to what the Bible teaches. Yeah, we don't do everything exactly the same way, but the principles we do apply in our life today. Think about that. So he can take her anywhere he wants to take her, do whatever he wants to do with her, and yet he has no responsibility in the matter. The Bible says he didn't find a wife, find a good thing. See, a young man is supposed to be looking for a wife. That means he needs to be ready to be a man to take care of her. His focus should be on being the best uh, Christian man that he can be and, and wait for the time when it's right, when he can find that right one and be able to provide for her, both spiritually, economically, emotionally, and physically. Amen? That's really what it's all about. It's not just a dating game that we see today. In Deuteronomy 7, in verse 1, it says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Persesites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and sometimes we hear the termites, right? Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Now think about this for a moment. Why was the, what was the number one reason why God wanted him to throw out all these folks? So that their pagan beliefs would not make an impression on God's people. Amen? Verse 2, it says, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Now, look at this. Now, as soon as they were to get victory, the very first command that God gave them was this. Look at this now. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make what? Marriages with them. Because God knew the minute that we made marriages with the unsaved, that it would be over. It would be done with. We were all to be defeated. Amen? You know that if your daughter or son marries someone who's unsaved, it's going to be a hard, long, arduous marriage. They've already been defeated before they even get started well. Marriage is already tough enough to try to get a female who is completely opposite of a male to even understand the same language, amen, and try to keep their focus on God and then to take on the responsibility of a family of children and paying bills and all the other things that come along with and serving the Lord along with that, it's already difficult enough. Now to add to that thing, a saved person with an unsaved person makes it that much more difficult. Odds were against them. I believe, that, see, people always make this comment. They say, well, you know what? Christian marriages are getting divorced at, a, at the same rate or even higher rate than the unsaved. One, I can tell you one of the number of reasons why. Because we get married the wrong way. Majority of Christians that walked out of getting married, they're not marrying in the Lord the way they should. We just don't see it. It's, it's, we call it life, uh, it's actually what we call a flirt, a flirt to convert type of thing, where they're, they're, they're looking for someone and they're looking at the physical and they're not looking at the spiritual and they find themselves in, 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 in bad shape. It goes on, it says here, neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy sons, for they will turn away. Look what it says here, folks. Thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. You see, God holds the parents responsible in this thing. You say, well, how can we be responsible? When they get older, we're not accountable for them. You are accountable for how you raised them and how you brought them up and the relationships you build with them. I'm not saying that they're not going to make their own decisions. Sometimes that does happen. It's by God's grace, amen? It's by God's grace. We understand that. But we want to do everything that we can to make sure that we have that relationship with them that we ought to. And I'm not talking about a buddy-buddy relationship. That comes later. I make, I make that very clear to, to my kids. I'm not your friend. I'm your dad. But we're going to have a respectful relationship. We're going to respect one another, right? And we're going to love one another. In Israel's history of captivity, in Jeremiah 29, verse 6, it says, Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, and they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be what? Increased there and not diminished. It was a way of God propagating uh, the Christian uh, world in that new land, in a captivity. He says, even though you had your own land, you disobeyed me in this area. Now that you've been taken captive, I, my, my commands have not changed. You still, even though in captivity, I still want you to marry in the Lord. In Genesis 38, 6, it says, And Judah took a, wife, uh, took a wife for heir. Here we see again a parent's involvement in marriage, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. In Genesis 28, 8, verse 1, it says, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged or commanded him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Here we see Isaac being involved in Jacob's life, the same way Abraham was involved in Isaac's life. And so we see the parents are involved. Let's get a, a, an example in the Bible of modern-day dating and romance. 
say, well, I didn't know there was an example in the Bible. Yeah, Hollywood is right here. Look at Judges chapter 14 and verse 1. The Bible is exciting, folks. You don't need to watch novellas. It's all here, amen? You can get spiritual novellas right here. In Judges 14, verse 1, it says, And Samson went down to Timnath. Now look at the first word here, and what? And saw. So what was his focus on? The, the physical, right? That means to please his flesh. He saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, could you imagine when he, Mom, Dad, I have seen a woman, a real woman. Right? He's pretty excited. He says, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, you got to get her. You know, most kids are coming and ask maybe for a car or, you know, something like that. But he's asking for this woman here. He says, you got to get her for me to wife. You, you just got to. Now, he knows the laws in the land. He knows the way it's supposed to work. The parents are supposed to be involved. But this is what we see today. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Even when we send our kids off to Christian colleges, that's no excuse. Sometimes they'll go over there and you assume that who they meet over there at Christian college is a godly person. That's not always the case. And they'll come back and say, Dad, I met this guy over at uh, such and such Bible college. And, man, he is great. You got to meet him, Dad. I think he's the one for me. Or they'll go wherever they go and they'll come back and say that, or whatever the case may be. In verse 3 it says, Then his father and his mother said unto him, In other words, they begin to remind him of God's laws. Look what she says. Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? So here the, the parents begin to try to talk sense into Samson here. And Samson said unto his father again, get her for me. You say, why was he like that? Because he saw something. He saw the, he, was, he was going after the fleshy aspect, not the spiritual. See, once we put the flesh first and we put the physical first and not the spiritual, then we're no longer interested in following God's word. Amen? And then look what he says here, for she pleaseth me well. He did not consider his parents and what they thought. He did not consider the fact that they had changed his diapers, they had fed him when he could not feed himself, that they had raised him up and cared for him all his life and now... He makes his, this, the most important decision outside salvation without his parents. He did not consider them. Once Samson disobeyed his parents, who represented God in this sense, it was not surprising to see there was a downward spiral from that point forward. His flesh took control of all his choices from there. He began to make fleshy decisions. He married outside God's will. He committed fornication twice. As a matter of fact, in J uh, Judges 16, verse 1, it says this, Then went Samson to Gaza and Saul there, we see again, he's, he's now, everything is about the flesh now. He's been controlled by the flesh and not walking in the spirit. As a matter of fact, he made the same mistake again in verse 1. It says, and went Samson to Gaza and Saul there harlot. Now it's even worse, he's a harlot. And went in unto her. And look at verse 4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And so he began to seek after that. He began to long after the flesh now, and that was controlling him. He was not longer concerned about the things of God. He defiled his, his Nazarite vows. He touched a dead lion. I mean, if you were a Nazarite, you could not touch anything that was dead. You could not cut your hair. You could not drink uh, wine from the vine. In an angry rage, he committed arson and destroyed, destroyed many of the Philistines' crops. He murdered and killed a thousand men with, a, with a, the, jaw, uh, the uh, jawbone of an ass. We saw that in the Bible there. So he did all these things. He murdered. He, he committed arson. All these things because he learned to make decisions based on the flesh. And because he short-circuited God's ways and refused his parents' counsel and took matters in his own hands, Samson's paid for his sin for the rest of his life. The desire that seemed to be so pleasurable proved to be an affliction on his soul. Once lust is gratified, then what? Sorrow and great misery and knowing God's best has been lost begins to enter the mind of that person who, who went against God's judgment. In Judges 16, verses 21 through 25 and 30, we find it continues on from there, that they poked his eyes out. Isn't it amazing that what he, what he used first to get him into trouble, which was his eyes, were then poked out? I kind of reminds me of that verse when it says uh, if, if, that you, if you cut off your arm, your, 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 your hands and your feet and so forth, uh, it's better to enter into heaven that way, maimed, than not to enter at all. <laughs> they bound him. 
They imprisoned him as a laborer. Think about this for a moment. He lost his testimony against his enemy. They mocked him, and he died in defamation and defeat. Man, what a way to end your life. He never thought that he began to make flesh a decision that it would end this way. The second example we see is Esau. We call him a rebel without cause. In Hebrews 12, 16, it says this, lest there be any fornicator or profane, that word means heathenness or wicked person, as Esau. You say, well, why was he a profane or wicked person? It says, for who, for one morsel of meat, sold his birthright. You say, what does it mean? What does that mean? Well, when a Christian begins to make decisions based on what they feel or after what the world does, they become like a heathen. Because what makes you a Christian is that you make decisions based on what? The word of God. And so we become profane when we make decisions based on the world or our flesh. Does that make sense? And so because he sold his whole entire birthright for one meal, God calls him profane because that's what the world does. They will sell their soul to gain the world that is only temporary and give up all eternity. Does that make sense? And so he became a profane person. So Esau was foolish. You say, wow. Because he married two wives together and still more in marrying, the, marrying Canaanites. They weren't even in the Lord. They were strangers to the blessings of Abraham. Esau is a picture of a soul living according to his desires, living on a low spiritual plane in a corrupt way. Esau determined to gratify his lust also and chose for himself what he thought would make him happy. And therefore, he lost everything. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 26, verse 34, we, we see how Esau's choices affected his parents. It says in verse 34, and Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Beshemoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which were a what? Grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. It grieved his parents when he married the wrong one. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 27, verse 46, it says, Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which were of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do to me? See, we as parents, we look forward to those grandchildren, don't we? We look forward to spending our time in the things of the Lord and fellowshipping, but we know that cannot happen if our, if our children marry the wrong one. And so parents are weary as a result of this. And that's all the more reason why we've got to raise our children to love the Lord right now, while that window of opportunity is open. Amen? You see, when we marry, we marry into an entire family in principle, but not necessarily in practice. When, we, when our children marry someone, they become part of our family. That's important for us to remember that. And they're going to be there until the day we die. That's how vital it is that our children marry the right people. So not only do we see this in, our, in involving our, our parents or our pastors, but also our prayers. Look at Genesis 24, verse 4, our prayers as well. He says, and he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thee thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And therefore shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And so we see it begins with prayer. We talked about that earlier. We've got to pray for that mate for our children. In verse 26, and the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. In verse 48, and I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord of God of Abraham, master of Abraham, in which he led me in the way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And so we see the example of prayer in our lives. And then thirdly, we see marriages must involve those who are, first of all, handsome. Now, handsome, the way we use it today, is not used the same way in Bible times, but it's simply someone who cares for their health, who takes care of themselves. And it can be used for a female or a male, unlike today. And so we must look for someone who is handsome. In verse 16, it says, And the damsel was very fair to look upon. We want to keep ourselves fit, amen? We want to be in shape. We want to eat the right foods and so forth. But in Proverbs 31, it says, Favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. We also understand that, more importantly, it's the character that matters. The second thing we want to look for is high morals. High morals, those that will care for their husband, not selfish in nature. In Genesis 24, verse 16, we see again that she was a virgin. She had saved herself for that special one. Neither had any man known her. You see, when that marriage takes place, that white dress represents, of course, we know, purity. 
Christian marriages are a reflection of Christ and the church. And when Christ comes for us, he wants us to be waiting for him. That means we're to be occupied serving him, but also living a life of purity and holiness that resembles our Savior. Amen. And so we see a parallel to the bride or the church prepared for the return of Jesus, the bridegroom in marriages as well. We see that example in Proverbs 31. It says, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. And so, therefore, she ought to care for her husband, have a heart of selflessness, not selfishness. And then, thirdly, we see she ought to be hardworking. She ought to care for the home. The home should be her heartbeat. It should be her first priority, not a career. Nothing wrong with having a career, but the home needs to be her, where she rests her head, where she takes pride in that. In Genesis 24, 16, C through 20, it says, And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up, and the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, Drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, drink, my Lord. And she hasted. I mean, she hurried along and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and draw for what? All his camels. I don't know the truth of this, but it has been said that camels can drink as much as 55 gallons of water. Man, if that's the case, then I don't see how she did it. <laughs> Amen. But she was a hardworking woman. You know, we're constantly after our kids at home. First of all, we just want them to clean up after themselves, right? And then we raise the standard a little higher than that. <laughs> Amen. But it's a struggle sometimes to get our kids to see the importance of going the extra mile, as the Bible teaches, to be part of our Christian character. Don't just do what mom and dad asked you to do, but do it better. Or look for things to do. Don't wait to be told what to do. How many of y'all are constantly talking about those things? I am constantly talking about those things. Why? Because we know the importance of it. They're going to need those, those abilities and that, that type of mindset later on in life. We know that marriage is not about us. It's about our family as a whole. Amen. People often say you give 50 and they give 50. No, you give 100. Amen. You give it all. We give it all to our family. That's our first ministry. And we see here that she was a hardworking woman. She had proven that. If you go ahead and read Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman, it talks about how she, she worked from home and all the things that she did for her household. And she didn't have to be told to do those things. She did them because she loved her husband. She loved her children. And her children rose up morning, every morning and called her blessed. Amen. That's what we want to see. But we have to propagate that in our children. It, you know, children will always go the opposite direction. That's their nature. And that's why we have to work hard as parents. Don't give up. Sometimes I know it gets hard. It seems like you have to tell them a million times. I find myself telling my son the same thing over and over. And sometimes I get almost angry at him. And I have to stop and say, you know what? This is my responsibility. This is what it takes. This is what it takes. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to lose this battle. It's way too important. Satan's not going to quit. And then lastly, we see hospitality. We'll have to close here. I won't be able to finish, but we'll finish next week. We see hospitality to care for our children. Look at verse, chapter 24, verse 23. It says, and said, whose daughters are thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Naar. And she said, moreover unto him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And so here we find one who was taken to hospitality. She had that nature. She was a really a great woman who was ready for marriage. And we see that here. And these are the kind of characteristics we want to find when we look for a mate for our Children. And let me say this in closing. Obviously, we know that things won't quite work out the same way they work out here when we look in the Bible. There may be a time when your son or daughter may come home and say, hey, I, I think I found that one. This is what I told my daughter. And this is what I pray for. I said, you get to choose them. I get to tell you whether you keep them or not. Amen. <laughs> and you just hope that they would choose them based on the spiritual aspect. Now, obviously, you have to be attracted to them. But beauty truly is in the eye of the beholder. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that God, in the same way we see here, that if we put him first in our life and we, 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 we are having our family devotions and we're talking about these things, you know, when I'm talking to our young people, I always remind myself, it's, if I wait until they're already adults to talk about some of these things, it's too late. When they're at the age of already ready to get married, it's too late. They have to know about these things right now. In the same way for us as parents, we have to be the ones that talk to them about these things. We had a... A class uh, last year where I got all of our boys together and I talked about uh, going through puberty. Why? Those things are important. They need to know about those things. We have to take that initiative as parents to get to them before Satan does. Amen? 
It's so important that we realize that these are the characteristics we want to find, not only in the spouse for our children, but we want our children to have these same characteristics. Amen. Because I believe with all my heart, if you have spiritual children, they will only want to marry someone who's spiritual also. That'll be their heart's desire. They won't go out and choose someone who's not spiritual if they're spiritual. And that's why it's so important. And so we'll finish next week as we bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your word. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your faithfulness in our life that you continue the work that you started until the day of Christ Jesus. But Lord, we also have our part to play. Or may we as parents, as grandparents, realize the importance of raising our children after your heart. To begin to teach them the importance of being responsible. Raising them to leave home and to cleave to their spouses one day. Developing a relationship with our children that is evoked on the love of Christ and uh, practicing mercy and grace in their life and also disciplining them when they need to be disciplined, but at the same time teaching them to obey you, Lord. Teaching them to obey you out of a heart of love, not of a heart of duty. And Lord, watching for signs of maturity in their life because we know that age is nothing but a number. We want to see maturity in our children. And Lord, we know that the only way that can happen is by your grace. Lord, I pray for everyone who's here this morning, Lord, that you help us to realize the importance in this area, that this is the second most important decision that we'll ever make outside salvation for our children. And Lord, help us not to take a back seat in this area as parents to realize that we are to be actively involved in our children's lives and knowing that the sovereignty of God is working in their hearts. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for this hour. Be with our pastor as he comes for the morning service. If there's anyone who's not saved, Lord, I pray you speak to their hearts. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your word that reminds us of these truths. Because we're forgetful people, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.